Thanks, Rob. That was really a very cogent and articulate overview to get us started thinking about epigenetics in the developmental origins of obesity. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce our second speaker, Andre Baccarelli, and then after he talks, we'll have just a few minutes for questions from the audience. So Andrea is the Mark and Catherine Winkler Associate Professor of Environmental Epigenetics in both the Departments of Environmental Health and Epidemiology at Harvard School of Public Health. His research focuses on identifying molecular and biological factors reflecting the impact of exposures on a number of health risks. Um, the title of his talk is Conceptual Models of Epigenetic Influence on Obesity Risk. Andrea. Thank you very much for the invitation of being here today. It's a real honor to be present in front of such distinguished audience and uh, in such a momentous uh, symposium. Um, so what I would like to do today is to bring forward our discussion to introduce potential conceptual models for uh, epigenetic influence, particularly considering my expertise in large human studies in epidemiology. And I would like to raise a few questions that I'm sure many of the speakers today and tomorrow will help answer. So let me start uh, by giving an example that I usually use in class, in my class of epigenetics in our school, which is a musical example. So what you see here on the left-hand side is a music score. Um, in my example, this is the DNA. It's very simple because in music, you have a specific, a specific sequence of notes over there that are translated into a phenotype. And this is a wonderful phenotype, a phenotype of a concert by the greatest uh, Herbert von Karajan over there. And you can understand that uh, if someone had a bad idea of putting me on the podium instead of von Karajan, the phenotype will change dramatically, correct? <laughs> Not to mention if they asked me to be the first violin. Um, so this is an example of how from the same DNA, and you saw a much better example from Bob just before, uh, of the agouti mice, you can get uh, completely different phenotypes. Um, but this doesn't tell us yet uh, where epigenetics is about. So if someone really had the idea of putting me on the stage, perhaps I could look over the music sheets of the performance next to me, and I would see that in several parts of the score, there would be something more than just uh, the sequence. You will see notes added onto the score, marks added onto the scores that say, for instance, louder or softer, perhaps. And this is really what epigenetics is about, are markings added onto the DNA, onto the score, that do not change the score, but they do change the phenotype. And for instance, here you see on top an example of musical silencing over there. Uh, and you can see changes on marks all over that change uh, uh, whether the score is expressed more or less. And one thing that I always say is that um, in music, as well as in epigenetics, you can distinguish two classes of markings. Markings that are applied in ink, they're permanent, and we heard from um, Dr. Waterland exactly the, about those, how many of the markings applied in early life, especially in fetal life, uh, they tend to be forever, or they tend to be very permanent. But there are markings that are in pencil, and they can be modified potentially at any time. And for instance, there is evidence that inflammatory genes, cytokines, interleukins, they have methylation markings that change in a matter of minutes. After 20 minutes, you don't see markings anymore. And we need to keep that in mind, that there are markings in pen, permanent, and markings that are, uh, can be written and rewritten and reprogrammed, more or less permanently. Um, I would like now to move and um, present a potential model that can be applied to obesity. Um, and here, uh, there is a central role, as you see, of uh, the fetal life. And we are certainly extremely interested in the idea that uh, in utero exposures can affect the embryo and the fetus, and potentially that would result uh, in a modification of the epigenome at birth. And and potentially, this epigenome at birth that you see, sorry, I cannot find a way to, to actually point on both of them. But uh, in this middle here, you see the epigenome at birth that, uh, that can program disease risk or obesity or risks associated with obesity. And I want to point out, obviously, that because uh, there are many marks uh, written in pencil, this epigenome at birth will, can be modified in childhood or as we become older. Um, and then there is all the concept here that uh, 
was just touched upon in the previous presentation that uh, the, not only uterine exposures are important, but also preconceptional exposures might be important. And the special exposure of the gametes, uh, gametes have their own epigenome and can be influenced and modified and reprogrammed by environmental exposures. And there is a lot of interest, obviously, on the epigenome of the parents, that what we do before we have kids in our childhood even might influence the risk of our, of our children. Um, and I put here an arrow that is uh, uh, broken, and the reason for that is because there is no clear evidence of uh, the importance of this mechanism, how important it is in humans, and some would argue whether it occurred at all. And I'm sure we can discuss more about this uh, these two days. Um, more simply, I want to apply this um, to obesity, and these mostly concepts that I uh, brutally plagiarized from Matt Gilman's uh, editorial and Dr. Ludwig's editorial in the New England a couple of years ago. And the concept I'm proposing here is that uh, uh, fetal life exposure would program the epigenome that we can measure at birth, but we can measure it even later in life. And again, there are dynamic changes. We can think about high BMI in the mothers, uh, gestational weight gain, gestational diabetes, or other environmental factors. And potentially, we could use the epigenome at birth or later in life to correlate that to uh, risk of obesity and its sequelae. Um, so after this uh, part, I would like to uh, go over and give some examples, and especially bring these examples to raise questions that I would leave open for the audience and the other speakers to address. Um, first of all, I would like to start from this paper that was published last year. It's in your booklet, um, if you want to read it more carefully, which is a study of DNA methylation and body mass index. So what these colleagues did, they took blood from um, um, three different studies, actually, and they did an epigenome-wide association study that we tend to abbreviate now to EBOS, uh, of DNA and the methylation and BMI. So they measured uh, this in um, a discovery cohort that was the cardiogenic consortium, about 500 people. These are adults. Um, replicated, they, did, they did to great extent to replicate them in two other studies, which are Martha and Cora. And what is really important is that the BMI and blood DNA methylation were measured at the same visit. Um, they had very interesting findings. Um, the first finding found uh, three methylation sites in uh, a gene, HIF3A. It's a hypoxia-inducible factor. Uh, methylation in this gene was positively correlated with, with BMI. Uh, and this was remarkably consistent across the three cohorts. They were able to replicate this across the three cohorts. And this gives, obviously, very robust results. Uh, one of these three sites uh, uh, was not just found in blood, but was also found in adipose tissue. So they had a different cohort that is called mother, and they were able to find this uh, association also in fat tissue and not in skin, which is what you would like to see because obviously if something is interesting to obesity, probably you want to see it in fat tissue rather than in skin. Um, and then they asked, um, is this a cause of obesity or not? And to address this question, they thought, why don't we look at SNPs? And if there are SNPs that, um, that modify methylation, um, we, that determine methylation of this gene, we need to find these SNPs also to be associated with the BMI, because the sequence would be SNPs methylation BMI. Um, if they do that, and they went there, and they, in a way, they failed to do this. Um, this is what we usually call Mendelian randomization, because two SNPs were indeed associated with methylation, but they were not associated with BMI. And their conclusion based on this finding was that uh, there were a perturbation of this gene, or methylation of this gene, and in general the pathway, that could have an important role in the response to obesity rather than in the causation of obesity. And just to explain what I mean, I borrowed a slide from uh, Caroline Relton here on the first row, um, in which she basically shows the same situation as what I showed in my model, of a flow of uh, mechanisms from prenatal life to the epigenome to intermediate phenotypes and disease. Let's uh, pause it for a second that this is uh, obesity or BMI. Well, and what she showed very 
effectively is that you can have also the other way around. That uh, if you, especially if you measure cross-sectionally the epigenome and the disease, you might have that the, instead of finding uh, epigenome modifying the disease, the BMI can modify the epigenome. Correct. And this, again, goes back to the idea that there are genes marked uh, in ink and, and some marked in pencil. And those marked in pencil can be influenced by obesity rather than being influenced by it. And this is something that in epidemiology we usually refer to as reverse causation. Uh, in reverse causation, cause and effect are reversed, or better, what we think to be the cause and what we think to be the effect are reversed. Um, and applied to BMI, to this study of BMI, uh, if we are interested in determining whether methylation causes high BMI, we need to consider whether high BMI is causing methylation. Um, and therefore, there is a need to identify, as Bob just said, the temporal or causal sequence of events. Um, and again, uh, perhaps uh, uh, longitudinal studies might, be, might be, want to be preferred in human epigenetics, and I put that as a question. Um, another thing I want to uh, um, do with, with you today is try to see whether we can learn from past experience. In particular, all the work that many of us have done in genetics. Um, and uh, for instance, this is uh, a, a slide that shows an association from a study uh, done in the 90s, actually in 1990, on uh, the association between a polymorphism in the dopamine rece receptor and alcohol dependency. And this is mostly associated with uh, craving and, uh, and reward mechanisms. And unfortunately, people who have this polymorphism are more prone to be dependent on alcohol. And uh, the first study that ever came out on this was a small study had large confidence intervals in the estimate and estimated that if you have this polymorphism, you are about nine, time, nine times as likely to, have, uh, to, have this, to fall into alcohol dependency. Um, however, the following studies, and these are ordered only by date of publication, gave you a different perspective. You can see that as you move forward, as the study becomes larger, the confidence interval shrinks. And actually, what you see, the final odds ratio, also the met, the, confirmed by the meta-analysis in this paper, uh, gave us an answer that the risk is only 40% higher. It's still a lot, but 40% higher. And this example is very nice. It's a very fortunate situation. There will be many examples that started from nine and ended, ended up at nothing. And so the question I have um, is whether we are in this situation. And um, any suggestion why this is happening? Why do we have a larger larger effects early on and then they become uh, moderate. Small sample size, publication bias. In fact, uh, I would suggest that this is why. And the reason, and the reason I want to give you an example of uh, how what happens on eBay or any auctions relates to what we might be doing today in epigenetics. Uh, this is called, uh, in fact, in genetics, is known as the winner's course, uh, on, uh, which applies both to eBay and genetics. On eBay, the issue is that why people put uh, uh, auction items on eBay? Because they hope that we pay more than what is the value of the item, correct? They hope that we overbid. And if you don't really know what is the value and you have a very poor estimate of the value of the item, you might end up overbidding. This is because in statistical term, there is a lot of variance in the estimated value in dollars of the item. So many people will overbid and many people will underbid. And the winner is likely to be cursed because it's the one who bid the most, correct? And this is what is happening also in, in, in genetics. In genetics, it happened a lot that the, the first to publish a, a positive finding was overbidding, was overestimating the effect. And uh, the question I have here, now that we are all publishing results that look wonderful and, uh, and uh, they are very, very, they, often they're solid and they, they look brilliant, are we doing the same thing? Are we falling in the winner's course or not? Um, another thing I would like to point out, and this has been already touched upon before, 
is that we are doing a lot of DNA methylation studies. This is um, a slide that shows NIH funding for epigenetics. The blue bar, the darker blue bar, is all the funding for epigenetics. And the purple bar is the funding for DNA methylation. You can see how most of the funding goes into DNA methylation. And there is much less in other mechanisms. Here I show the other two bars are uh, histone modifications and microRNAs. So uh, the, what the question I want to raise, uh, is there opportunity and what we should be doing about the other epigenetic mechanisms? Um, finally, I want to touch on um, um, one point here that is about how we model uh, DNA methylation and epigenetic in general. And I want to draw again on a parallel between genetics and epigenetics. So what we are doing mostly today is, uh, is looking at uh, how the environment modifies the epigenome and then down the line how the epigenome modifies the risk of uh, disease. Uh, in, in genetics, though, we have done a couple of other things. Uh, sorry, we've done also another thing which is we did look on the left-hand side how the epigenome, sorry, the environment modifies the genome, and this is what we call genetic mutations. Very often in cancer, correct? The a carcinogen would damage the DNA and cause cancer. But a lot of what we have been doing is also thinking that the genome would make us more or less susceptible to the environment. And this is what we call gene by E or gene-environment interaction. So if, as we heard before, the epigenome is written in ink, it doesn't change over time, could we be looking also at the second situation, a situation in which the epigenome actually modifies the effect of environmental factor? And we should probably, I should probably be changing now all the model that I presented so carefully just before. So um, I want to conclude by giving, rather than a summary, a summary a summary of conclusions, a summary of questions that I hope will be expanded upon in, uh, in our um, uh, today or discussion. Um, first, um, um, interpretation of epigenetic findings, uh, how to discriminate antecedent changes versus responses, as, as, identi as shown by the example on the BMI study. And if, even if they are antecedent, are they the driver of the disease or are just coming along? They are just a passenger. Um, the other question is, are we at risk of the win winner's course? And if so, how to avoid it? And about new directions, uh, what are the most promising, less explored, most exciting epigenetic mechanisms? And uh, is looking at the effect of the environment on the epigenome enough? And down the line, uh, it's a question that might look philosophical, but I think it's really the most important is the meaning of what we are doing. And um, why are we doing this? And are we looking for mechanisms or uh, biomarkers? And, um, and down the line, I think the answer to this question is uh, what are the benefits of what we're doing to patients and society? I would like to thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, we are, uh, this is not on eBay, but we are, uh, we are uh, looking for postdocs. If you know of any, please let us know. Thank you so much.